This is Speed at the bottom of the Lelix with our last NMRIX clinic for the day. With us, we have an architect living and working in the county of Hawaii. Imagine that. Raised in the Pacific Northwest, north of Seattle in the San Juan Islands, building model railroads since nine when he spent all of his first paper route money on a Tyco train set. Since then, he has moved several times and built several layouts, primarily in HO scale. In 2000, he branched out into large scale using live steam and battery powered with radio control. At home, he has been working on an O-scale narrow gauge layout using battery power for many of his locomotives. Today, he will be discussing his successes and failures for our pleasure and entertainment. We welcome Neil Erickson from Uma Uma. Aloha, Speed and everyone else. Thank you for having me. Um, Gordy, my coffee cup is empty, so you'll just have to bear <laughs> with me. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think we ought to do some uh, business. I mean, the bathroom's right outside or around the corner. Please turn off your cell phones. Um, I'm advertising uh, Modeler's Life and the Hawaiian Railway Society. So hope you will think about supporting both of those. So today, I don't know, Gordy, if you're going to switch me over to my presentation and I can get started with that. Yeah, it's it's done. Ah, we're already here. Well, you can see this is a large scale locomotive, uh, G scale, actually, 1 to 20.3. And it um, it's battery and sound. It has a tsunami sound in it and some very, very large batteries. Um, this caught me started in, in dead rail. This runs, on, runs in the garden. It is flawless, runs all the time. And of course it doesn't receive any battery uh, power or power from the rails. It's all from the batteries, right? So I'm gonna go through some of these. Um, well, let's just keep going. I Basically the interest in dead rail seems to be growing, right? Dead rail, I think, if you look at my little definition there, is a battery powered locomotive with wireless control. Dead rail is a term that I think a lot of people find offense with, although it is as opposed to live wires, like live electronics, but it's also been called other things, you know, like cold rail, um, battery on board. So there's a lot of different ways to de to describe this. But if you look at the little diagram there, you can see basically the battery goes into a form of a receiver. And I will talk about that more. Um, and then from there, it can go, it can go, and I think this is an important distinction, it can go to a, a DCC decoder. And of course, it doesn't have to. And we'll talk about some of the products out there available. But uh, certainly, you don't have to have DCC, you don't have to have sound. But the way that the market is going, and I think that the way that the industry is going is reflecting that DCC has become a de facto standard. It's robust, it's well documented, and it's easy to control, as you'll see in a moment, using some of these apps and, um, and devices that are out on the market. So what exactly am I talking about, right? So Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, are just a couple of uh, radio frequency protocols that we use. And others like Linux uses um, a Wi-Fi module, or excuse me, it's a radio frequency module that was used in a lot of um, radio control. And in particular, the Tam Valley system, which I believe he may no longer be using, but it was very common. And I have some examples here. There's one from North Coast Engineering, NCE, that um, is still available and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So what is the advantages here? You know, why are we using battery power? And, you know, what do you think its future is? These are, these are questions that I'm actually sure I can't answer, but I think it's really important that we think about it and support the idea because I think it's going to be a way to introduce model routing into a a younger population if it can be done simply uh, inexpensively but give you a lot of flexibility for growth and control so the size of batteries the size of receivers all the integration that's coming and i'll show you some examples again um, are making this really really easy to do without the kind of things i'm going to show you that is you know i've been doing for years is just a 
a do it yourself kind of project. Um, some of these are still that way, but you know, they're getting to the point where they're becoming more standardized. Batteries, of course, um, in large scales used to be NICAD. I think my, my Shea is NICAD, uh, but lithium polymer and lithium ion batteries are becoming more popular. You know, there's promise of, you know, other types of battery batteries coming out, inclu including like super caps, which we use basically as a backup way of, of storing power for some locomotives. Now, if you, you know, if you get a Soundtracks locomotive, you'll get a little capacitor in there, not necessarily a super capacitor, but it will allow you to go over some dead spots for a second or two without the sound or the, or the control being lost. Well, <laughs> control is another matter, but at least the sound will continue. But the batteries are getting smaller, getting getting a lot more powerful. And I think, I'll, you know, I can call, show you some in a moment that I'm using in my O-scale locomotives, uh, O-scale narrow gauge, um, that are completely um, compatible with HO and maybe N-scale in trailing cars or dummy locomotives. So the question, again, whether rail power or radio control, um, you know, has anything to do with batteries. It has, you know, in my opinion, has everything to do with batteries. You know, the, the fact that we're talking about dead rail today means that you're interested in it. Although, you know, a lot of people wonder why don't I, you know, put a battery in my engine and charge it off the rails like you would with a, a capacitor? Well, batteries don't like to be charged and discharged, um, you know, frequently, but there are charging Pro, um, boards that can help manage that. There are um, protected batteries that will help from overcharging or discharging. And those kind of things are, are important if you're thinking about choosing battery power. I mean, some of the things that are advantages, of course, the elimination of wiring to switches and frogs, reverse loops, Ys, turntables. And of course, you can even, you know, make your track look weathered, dirty, rusty, what have you. And and, and paint it, and there's really no need to have power coming from the rails. But if you want to draw power from some portion of the rails to charge your batteries from the rail, you're now going to have to start thinking about, you know, keeping those wheels clean, keeping the section of the, the track clean. And every time you go around the layout, you're going to be picking up dirt and dust and paint on the wheels. And it helps, you know, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. It inhibits the, the transfer of electricity, obviously. And the idea of having a charging port, like in the diagram, or some other method of charging, I think is the biggest hurdle that this industry needs to overcome, besides some form of standardization. Um, speaking of which, capacitors or stay alive, keep alive, you know, they're, they're known by different names. There's do-it-yourself kind of versions. I've read about them on Model Railroad Hobbyist forums. Uh, you know, they're an alternative, but I think the bottom line is all of these solutions might provide you a little power over dead frogs, even dead sections of track, but you're gonna lose control of your train, right? So I think that's why needing radio receivers in your engines will eliminate that loss of control. There are a lot of products available for us to consider, right? I'm excited about a lot of these. I don't have any hands-on experience with most of them, but I felt like this is a good way to curate them all in one spot and run them past everybody else so you can make your own decisions. So there are no oh, standards, right? even you know battery voltage, number of batteries. Um, I'll show you some examples of batteries that I use, whether they're built up to from 3.7 volt uh, lithium polymer batteries or they're standalone. You know, they have different applications and but they need different kind of battery management. Um, the you know the, the, the products that you can buy off the shelf, like I said, are becoming more and more numerous. Um, right now, the one I'm gonna show you a little bit is this new Blue Rail Trains, uh, what they call Blue Rail DCC. And it's really interesting. It has an app and I'm showing you the Steam application because that's my interest. But um, on the bottom of the screen on the left-hand side, you can see 
you can control pretty much all the same things you would um, using a normal, basically conventional throttle. This is, happens to be on an iPhone um, and it's an app that's free. You download it and it, again, it's proprietary, but you can change the, the CVs on the fly. Um, one thing that I've suggested is that if you're gonna have a lot of momentum and coasting, that maybe there should be a way to uh, break that locomotive too. So there's some advantages to the blue rail trains like being able to control those CVs, being able to connect to a locomotive fairly inexpensively. It can run off of rail power or it can run off of battery power. Um, rail Pro is becoming super um, popular, developed in Canada. Um, I believe it's developed in Canada. It's uh, sort of an entire package like a DCC system. It promises really amazing things. They don't really tout it as a battery powered system, although I imagine it could be. It does draw power from the rails, but it is a wireless connection directly to the locomotive. And if you look in the in the diagram, the um, it's an, it's sort of a family suite of of products where they have um, not only the handheld controller and it has a color screen, and, you know, a lot of flexibility about what you can do with that, but it has other components, um, battery chargers and power supplies, and more importantly, it has a very very small um, receiver, motor controller, and sound card all built into a, a chip that just plugs into the standard NMRA connection. Um, a couple come out recently that are Wi-Fi based. In other words, you connect to the locomotive by choosing uh, the Wi-Fi that it's transmitting. Uh, LocoFi uh, is probably the least expensive that I've found on the market comes with a speaker, produces diesel sounds, it's a, it's a downloadable application, and it can run on batteries very easily. And you can see from the picture on the left-hand side, page six, that this is designed to fit right in and replace the board, maybe on a standard um, HO diesel locomotive. It's pretty interesting that it, you know, you don't really need much more than what's shown right there. And I believe the total price to get involved in this is less than $100. And maybe that's more than you want to spend. But if that's all you had to spend and get involved in, in model railroading, that doesn't look too bad. You might notice that there's an SD card in there and they promise that you can download sounds directly to that. So there's some options there that are kind of fun. Um, the, uh, the company called Wi-Fi Tracks is another on the right-hand side, page seven. Um, it's kind of exciting because they've taken what I believe is kind of a standardized board that allows you to plug in different components. Um, sort of like a, you know, an interface board that replaces the one in your locomotive. These are designed for HO scale and you can have a battery of your choice. You can have a battery controller, you know, charge controller um, and a decoder of your choice. There's the, eight pin NC, uh, NMRA connector there. And it's, uh, you know, it's pretty exciting that this is sort of an all-in-one package with a, not only uh, a downloadable app, but several that allow you to integrate um, uh, different components in the layout for controlling switch machines and turnouts. They have a tower operator app. You know, this, this looks like it could be really exciting uh, what's interesting is that if you go on to the next one, the Stanton S cab, which has been around a long time, and they have um, a receiver that's basically was a uh, a, uh, a wireless radio radio receiver and a motor controller, and he has developed um, a way to do something very similar. In fact, I wonder if one is not licensed to the other. So as I turn the page. You might see on this top upper left picture that it looks pretty similar to the previous page. Let me go back real quick. And you notice that these two boards, that's top and bottom, it's not this, it's the same board. And then this board fully populated from Stanton um, look identical. Interesting thing is that you can get it fully wired so that you could get the SCAP battery power controller um, charging from the rails. You can get a single cell LiPo battery. 
Uh, you can choose your own decoder. This one's showing a soundtracks uh, TSU 2200. Um, and that one is bundled with the receiver so that not only do you have battery control, but you have um, and you know NMRI decoder and it comes, you know, speaker and motor control. That one's just shown for testing purposes, obviously, right? And I'm gonna show you one of these because I love the fact that it has a magnetic reed switch. Um, so you can turn on and off the power and disconnect the battery. They, Neil Stanton um, developed this and his uh, handheld throttle is the one on the lower left. It's similar to some of the others that you see on the market. It has a slide controller for the throttle and you know switch for the direction. Uh, so it's it's um, pretty basic, but you know it it does a lot of things and it transmits over the frequency uh, 916 megahertz. So it it may be compatible with some of these others that transmit on the same frequency, like the one on the next page by um, CVP. So CVP. Um, you know, or AirWire, you know, I think this is Keith Gooders has been doing this for years. And if you go to their website, you'll see that he has a lot of product for large scale as well as HO and, and O scale products. These are the throttles that I like to use, the T5000. Um, it also has a T1300, which has no screen. I wonder if I saved a picture of that. I did not. Anyway, so there is an ops throttle, so you can hand it to somebody and you don't have to worry about them, you know, selecting different locomotives or changing um, CVs on the fly, which by the way, most of these radio controlled throttles can do. You can change your CVs uh, on the main, you know, pretty much as you're, dry, you're running a locomotive and it won't affect any of the others, of course, because it's direct connection to the locomotive. So, the CVP uh, T5000 is my choice, but um, there are others. There are some, the kind of, the, here's by the way, their receiver with a battery that would go in a locomotive. And you know you can also pair it with a, a DCC decoder. So uh, this seems to be the direction that the you know, manufacturers are going. Basically a board or a receiver with integrated connections for battery, battery management, uh, maybe charging and you know, a way to plug in your decoder of choice. Um, so pretty interesting. So this one looks like, you know, there's some charging connections if you'd like, or you have to snip them in this case because CVP doesn't support the charging via the rails. Um, if, if you're interested in doing or tinkering with this kind of stuff, then you have to realize you're trading wiring your layout for wiring your locomotives. It's not, you know, if you've wired with some of this 30 gauge wire, you realize this is not um, for the shaky hands or someone that's uh, has no nearsighted vision. Um, there are ways to do it. And there's certainly a lot smaller form factors out there, but the one down here from Yankee Dabbler is the NCE receiver. Um, that's, Similar, it's available still online, even though NC doesn't produce them anymore. Although rumor has it, the NCE is coming up with something new. So we'll see what direction they're going. I'm, I'm very curious. There are other products like um, by MRC, the Loco Genie. I've experimented with that. I got it out recently and the batteries, of course, were left in there too long and kind of did, corroded all of the connections. <laughs> so, you know, once you get into this and let, I think I'm spread too thin, but you should probably choose something that you feel comfortable with and stick with it. Because if you start playing around with these different kind of products, be ready to, for some of them to fail. Um, so some of the common concerns about wireless and radio control locomotives is that they're difficult to detect on the rails, um, but I mean, really, it's not. I mean, it's, if you're putting power to the rails, whether or not you're using the power to charge the batteries or not, or to run the trains or not, you know, you can put resistors across your wheel sets and you can still detect uh, current flow. Again, got to keep those rails clean. You're going to have to have enough of the rails where you want detection um, wired, right? So those kind of things are um, out there. 
And there's other solutions too by using infrared controls uh, for triggering the events, signals, switches. And um, with the uh, popularity of Arduino, this is um, really um, commonplace. If you want to go with more commercial systems, you know, um, besides JMRI, you know, Bruce Chubb's CMRI, or even I believe, um, oh, someone correct me, um, LNE, you know, I can't remember what it was called, but there's other technologies coming out here and TCS, for example, um, is supposedly developing some more products that along with their throttle that will connect to wireless systems. Now, one thing I didn't touch on was that the TAM Valley products are still being manufactured and I have a throttle here, but what's really interesting is that he sells um, a transmitter that can be connected to your, your bus, and it's basically an antenna. So now you can use your Digitrax, NCE, or other DCC throttle to communicate wirelessly directly to locomotives that have um, receivers built into them. So there's no reason why manufacturers shouldn't be able to do this, right? They shouldn't. They should be able to give us the option of wireless control, um, and I think that we need to support it, even if it's not there yet. Only because if we don't support this technology, I don't think it will grow. And this is a second hobby or a second business for a lot of young people that are interested in it. Um, there are a lot of guys doing radio controlled automobiles and trucks and forklifts and all kinds of things, cranes. Uh, Marty Jenkins probably showed some examples of that, if not today, but you know, previously where he's doing radio controlled vehicles. I believe in HO scale and, and it's staggering to think that you could get a receiver in there and motor controller as well as turning the, uh, the front wheels. So the technology is changing, it's getting smaller, and you know I think we need to find a way to help support this so that we can uh, create a gateway for young people to enter into this hobby at a, at a lower price or something that become more open and flexible. So I'm gonna switch over to another camera so that you all can see what I'm doing on my workbench. And I don't know if, um, Gordy, you can switch over for me. Yeah, I'm just uh, just sorting that out in the background. All right, I'm going to switch it over and kind of give you guys a better point of view of what's going on here. So. Just a sec, just a sec. Yep. I'm just hoping that we didn't just, hopefully we didn't just kill everything. <laughs> Oh, we're still good. You're uh, you're on. You're you're maximized. I can make you full screen, so it's all good. <laughs> well, I should have started off by saying aloha, a Hawaiian welcome, and uh, in return, you're supposed to say aloha back. So, Gordy and Speed, aloha. 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 For everybody else out there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've been playing with as far as tools and supplies and uh, experiments I'm doing here. And I realize I've, I've already used up about half of my time, but if you have questions, I have no problem with that. Um, recently, my um, soldering iron became a little, um, I don't know, temperamental, I guess, and uh, just wasn't getting enough heat. So I went and got this Ryobi battery powered <laughs> now, I never would have thought this existed, but a battery powered soldering iron, and it's, it uses these 18 volt batteries, you know, and of course you got to keep it all in this, and good thing it's not hot, I burned myself more than once, um, you know, it uses the 18 volt batteries that, that come in uh, one to four amp hours, and I just happened to have this in handy, and I was super impressed that when I turned it on, it went from flashing to warming to solid red in less than a minute or probably less than 30 seconds. And you can watch that for yourself, but having a good soldering iron for doing electronics, I think is super important. You know, you got to keep the tip clean, obviously. And I don't know if um, Kevin Marks is out there uh, or if he did a presentation this time, but uh, learning how to solder is, is easy, but it's super important. 
that you get it right because it's not welding. It doesn't require a lot of heat. This, it's already hot. This provides a lot of heat. And honestly, I think it's probably too much for electronics, but it's, uh, it would be awesome for um, you know, doing switches. Uh, it's, it's fast and it really recovers quickly. So I'm gonna turn that off and put it away and hopefully I don't uh, burn myself up there. Yep. Anyway, you should have a little better view. The other thing I like is this Lazy Susan. Uh, you can tell it's been around a while. You do everything on here. You can build models, weather things, you can paint and you can spin around and, and get different point of view for things. I was gonna show you a, a locomotive that I'm gonna work on today. Um, but let me start out by saying there's a gazillion different um, things that you can buy on eBay for pennies. Essentially, you know, um, a choice of connecting wires of all different colors, right? Get these in a pack. Um, I have detectors and Arduinos and IR de um, devices, infrared you know, devices. There's um, uh, the Bachman motor controllers look like this. And I don't know why I keep them, but um, I know I have several because I look at them for reference for the wiring. And I think it, you know, without having the sheet of paper in front of me, just having something physical it helps me a lot. I'm sure others are like that. We were talking about, at least I was talking about, since I can't hear you, I was talking about these um, little teeny uh, lithium polymer batteries. Here's one that is, how do I describe this? Um, I should have got a tape measure. Uh, this one's three centimeters long, one centimeter wide, and about a third of a centimeter thick. This thing is amazing. It's only a 170 amp hours, but if we're talking about using batteries to, you know, that will be charged on the rails or, you know, for motor control only, there are ways to use just one of these, or you can gang them up like this. So three of these 3.7 volt batteries will make 11.1 volts, which is more than adequate for a lot of the things we do. And you can buy them pre-wired like this as well. So, I mean, there's these things are literally pennies. Um, some things that have been fascinating me lately are, um, you know, little um, on off switches, uh, read switches, uh, you know, magnetic switches to turn the batteries on and off. And then recently, and of course I couldn't find it today, were all of the little USB, micro USB connectors that you can get and conceal pretty easily underneath a locomotive if you wanted just to plug in a charge cord or if you wanted to charge through some port or something where you would drop in maybe a water tank spigot and have it connect, which is pretty, pretty cool. Oh, by the way, this, um, this is what is commonly known as a buck converter. Uh, it's essentially a little teeny transformer that will bring in, in my case, um, a 3.7 volt battery and or or 7.2 you can you know you can bring these in or what's that two times 3.7 7.4 volts and or a um, regular 11.1 volt battery just connected here and the output is always about 12 13 volts 12 is you know you can it's adjustable but you could get that set dialed in right as whatever you need um i didn't talk about one of my favorite tools but i think everybody needs good volt ohm meter. This one is self ranging. Um, I don't know how well that shows up, but it, this is voltage. And then of course, ohms, uh, amperage, and then um, continuity. And if I touch the ends of this, this is super helpful for looking for shorts on switches and other locations, you to get a, a sound. So these were available from Radio Shack. If anybody remembers Radio Shack, I'm sure they're still out there. Um, let's see, where shall I go next? Oh, here's the, uh, the way the buck converter looks when it comes packaged. These are literally less than $2. Um, and they're pretty amazing. They work great. There are other choices too. Um, let me put these away since they're just cluttering up the place. Mm. 
The receivers I talked about, um, these come with or without motor control, but these two ha happen to have um, motor control as well as um, RF receivers. This one has a nine pin connector, so you can just come right out. I have it right now set up to a eight pin plug. So um, you know, I'm not using the green or the brown. Uh, this one comes standard with the JST connector. And I have uh, this one, well, I'll show you more about how I do these, but these are little plugs that I make up. Um, recently, there was a Zoom conference on dead rail. If you're interested in learning more about dead rail, you can get on Facebook and join the um, dead rail page and they they do Zoom meetings frequently. And there's a lot of questions and answers. Um, and one of the things that I think Pete came up with Steinmetz um, was that instead of having two plugs, he, he had three, so one would be dead. So there's only one way to plug them in without you know making sure you get your polarity correct. Fascinating, I mean, very, that's no, genius actually, Pete, good job. Um, of course, I have also out here another Bachman uh, decoder and I keep this around because it has a really nice clear wiring. So your pinouts, um, you know, I don't have to remember that the red one is always um, number one, right? Because when you look at a plug for a decoder uh, input in a locomotive or, or in my rail car, you usually say one or eight somewhere on the board. Um, for example, this little rail car has your standard eight pin plug. I don't know if that's even visible. Let's see if I can get some more light on it. Yeah, at any rate, I'm sorry. It has an eight plug NMRI connection. And then I've used the RF module, right? That provides radio frequency and control with the eight pin connector. And all I did was plug it in. And, you know, I can run it using wireless control. The, um, you know, the interesting thing here is I could cut <laughs> the red wire and the black wire, and which I do frequently, and use um, micro JST connectors to go to a battery. Um, and so you can just integrate a battery between the motor and the module so that uh, instead of bringing powers from the rails, you can bring power from a battery. Just that simple. It's, uh, I say just that simple. It really is actually, it's not rocket science. Um, here is the uh, nine pin NMRA connector. Um, why we can't standardize, I have no idea, but I understand the hobby is evolving and keeping track of all these wires and what they do it's just a matter of learning that, for example, you know, the black and the red are from the rails, uh, the orange and the gray are for, to the motor, um, blue, yellow, white are for your lighting, and then you have some extra functions in here. So you, um, you're gonna be checking something frequently if you get involved in wiring these. Again, you don't have to, you can buy some of these boards pre-wired and of course you don't need to integrate um, a DCC decoder at all. That's that, um, let me set that aside. These little porters are the cutest little buggers. This is an ON30040 and I don't know how many I have, it's embarrassing. Um, this one is an 040, some of mine are 042s. Uh, I wanted to break them up and add the Wi-Fi control, you know, radio control, not Wi-Fi control, radio control to one of these. And they're really not designed to be converted, but with a little head scratching, you know, I managed to um, put the receiver in the, in the roof of the cab here. And it has a, um, <laughs> what am I trying to say? Um, magnetic reed switch on the top so I can turn the locomotive on and off. And then of course the battery is not very uh, attractive. I haven't bothered to try to conceal it as a coal or a wood load, but you certainly could, you certainly could. Um, this one is uh, 
taking a few nosedives to the floor, but I use it a lot just to play around with and try my rails out because it, it finds all the failures. Um, this is the Tam Valley controller, although I could be using the, the uh, CVP T5000, but I'm gonna turn this one on. Oh, it is on. Um, why is it not on? And it's gonna start up and say, okay, so it's looking for a locomotive. I think it's set to loco number one. And if I start this locomotive, it's supposed to go. Um, I have a sergeant engineering magnetic pick. So let's just see if I can't turn this on. And without messing things up. Always when visitors come, right? Well, of course they tested it a moment ago and we'll just pretend that it's uh, working. Hmm. I'll be darn. Maybe I put a dead battery in there. I'm sorry. Anyway. It is fun to run this around the layout when you play, when you play with me. Hmm. She's bothering me. If you can see the logo on the side of here, you'll see why I'm bothered. Um, moving on, I'll come back to you. You'll probably take off like a shot. Seems like they would put a light in here so you can tell whether or not the thing is on or off. Unlike this one. Or this was Neil's idea of a breadboard. <laughs> Funny, but not. And uh, this one has the Stanton boards for the battery charging via the rails, as well as um, the battery uh, module for going to the motor control, which in this case happens to be a wow sound. Um, and it has an on and off um, magnetic read switches. So if I, if I find the on, there you can see the light came on and it would go to power the wow sound to steam and then you can turn it off. Now these would be really nice just to mount up on the underside of a an oil tender, which I intend to do on this one. Um, so that one I'll set aside because I'm, I do want to come back to it, but I wanted to get going on something that's garbage. Um, the example that I think is pretty fascinating here is this little teeny um, Blue Rail Trains DCC board. Now, the previous one was pretty big by comparison. And again, this is, uh, it's four millimeters long and, you know, one millimeter, well, maybe one and a half millimeters wide. And it has a, a standard four plug JST connector, uh, you know, sort of a surface mount one. And the, um, I have a piece of double-sided tape on the backside, so I don't touch it on anything stupidly. This, is the Bluetooth version and it's run using uh, an iPhone app right now. Uh, what's interesting about this is that you can control all the CVs right from your app. And I think I mentioned that. And so what I did is I wired up um, a Tsunami T1000 with a little speaker from Soundtracks. And then I made my own little eight pin plug. Um, I was gonna show you that these come in a little package and I use them a lot for batteries just because that's been my standard and that's pretty small so you could probably even conceal that in a locomotive and you can see how I wired um, maybe you can't see it but this is the 
the connection to my battery. So if I uh, find the battery, <laughs> let's take it out of this guy and see if he makes a difference. If I just take it out. Um, now this is one thing that I think would shock a lot of people is that we do have to touch our engines and take them the batteries in and out and someday that'll all change again here's the the female receiver side on the battery and if i plug it in to this i want to make sure i have red to red in my case right but before i do that i'm going to plug in the blue rail board and when i plug in the battery with any luck we'll hear a little sound so the engine is idling And if I can find my old iPhone, we'll launch the application. So if I just run it without an engine, it should, well, I don't know what's going on here. Let me go back and connect to my 280. I, I've named it, I've set up some CVs. And uh, this one, you can run multiple chains at once, but you can, that's a pretty amazing little speaker. So, this app is free, of course. I think this board was, I'm not mistaken, it's about $100, maybe a little bit more or less. Of course, you need the Tsunami decoder if you want to use DCC. And then in my case, um, I wired up my own little plug. So I wanted to show you how sort of easy it is to put in this into a locomotive. This is um, a Bachman 280, you know, outside frame. And I've got a, uh, let me just pull that off, um, oil tender down there. And let me just unplug this, it's rather irritating. And if I pull this up, and set it where you can see it. I don't know if this is clear enough for y'all, but I've already taken the screws out. I think you saw them on my magnet. Everybody should have a little magnet sitting around for screws and things unless you want them rolling off the table. But if you take this off like this, the rear backup light is just connected here to some little um, similar connectors to the one I made. And you can see I've already taken out the, um, the Bachman decoder, little eight pin connector and uh, it was just a matter of slipping this guy right out of there. This had no sound, obviously, right? So there's no speaker. So this locomotive would now be connected to my new 8-pin connector. Now I always have to remember which one's which. If you remember now, I'm no longer using power from the rails, right? So the red and black um, no longer are relevant in this case. The other one, I, I was using power from the rails to charge the batteries, but this one I don't. Now, since red and black aren't on there, you have to remember that uh, number eight was uh, up there in the corner. Hopefully I got this right. Otherwise my locomotive will go backwards. So I'm gonna start up my engine again with the uh, first plug in my battery. I brought some little micro switches to show you that you can change for charging if you have a charging port. Um, but I frankly just like pulling the battery out and replacing it. You probably figured that out. So again, with the app, I, I connect with it. I choose one locomotive, just generally check and make sure things are working. don't seem to have any lights. So I wonder if I've got this in 180 degrees off. We'll see in a second, because if I start going here, it's definitely going in reverse. So that's probably what happened. So this is all a work in progress. I love playing with this stuff. 
I'd rather be building models, frankly, but this stuff takes me down a rabbit hole and it, um, it's a wonderful journey. I'm gonna try one more time. Let's see if I can get it going in the right direction. We're now going forward. Awesome. Let's see if my headlights come on. Nada. So something's wrong there. But I wired this up this morning just to give it a try. And you notice that my throttle's all the way down and my momentum's kind of high. So it's going to keep coasting until I stop it. It would be nice if we had some braking functions. Anyway, I think my 45 minutes are nearly up and I didn't want to run out of time for questions. So speed, ready? The, the, the sooner the better. I'm sorry I took a little bit longer than I planned. No problem. What's the name of that app that you were using? This one's called Blue Rail Trains. Blue Rail Trains. Mm -hmm. Okay. So starting from the beginning, there was a big question. Can you run these, um, let's call it dead rail for now, simultaneously with DCC? Absolutely. Someone was thinking because... of running short wheel switchers with uh, trouble with the frogs. Um, read, read the handout that I attached to the, our, uh, the Facebook site because you can run these independently and right alongside your, your DCC system. Um, in fact, I, I think one of the greatest benefits to having a radio controlled engine is that you can have a, a cleaning train, you know, run hours or days before you're gonna have the crew over and pull behind it, you know, the clean cars and get it all going, right? Get it, make sure it's all clean and ready to go. And you don't have to worry about putting power to the tracks until everything's dry and, and good to go. So, but right. absolutely, you can run them side by side. Do you know if anybody thought about using induction? like our smart toothbrushes to charge the batteries? You know, it's funny you'd mention that because I have one that I brought with me um, that I was going to show you. And, uh, you know, the minute you ask me, I can't find it. This <laughs> one um, is big, right? Granted, right? I don't know if you yeah. can see, but it's quite large. There are others out there, but this one from Polo Lu uh, was a way for me to kind of try out inductive charging. I didn't know what to do with five volts until I found the Stanton board. So now I might try this. If you notice, it, it does fit inside my ON30 tender. Cool. The question is, where do I park it? Yeah. Right. So I don't know yet. Uh, but the idea of pulling up next to uh, an engine house to recharge is pretty cool. It's a cool idea. Okay, what kind of battery voltages are we talking about? Are they all the same or? No, no, no. In fact, I put most of those away here, but uh, most of the the LiPo batteries that are available that I buy that are um, protected, what we call you know, power protected, are 3.7 volts. And these... Um, come in all different sizes, right? Mm -hmm. I think you saw the, the one I had earlier, you know, is uh, is kind of a big flat one. And it looks like this, right? But you don't need to, to gang them together like I've done now, because now these, these battery controllers and buck converters will let you, you know, jump up. This one is three quite small ones. I think these are uh, 300 milliamp power batteries all stacked together, three of them in a row. And I wired them all in series so that you would get 11.1 volts. Um, but again, you know, it depends on what your goal is here. If you're going to be charging from the rails, I think that you don't need a whole lot of battery power, maybe just enough to get through um, turning on the turntable or getting through a Y. So you don't have to worry about, you know, managing all of that kind of um, electronics. And certainly yeah. those boards are not inexpensive. Your opinion on the battery safety circuits that's built in on these batteries? I am still not completely sold. Um, some of mine are rather old, and I think I showed you during my last clinic that they can grow, <laughs> and that's <laughs> not a good sign. And these are, are uh, a good example. They're not supposed to be that thick, and I left them charging <laughs> for days uh, stupidly, and uh, I was lucky I didn't 
catch something on fire, honestly, because I, I imagine that could happen if they burst. Yeah, don't make don't make the Samsung and Apple mistake of not leaving room for them. Yeah. <laughs> where do you uh, where do you buy your uh, lipo ba lipo batteries? I have some uh, dealers on eBay that I trust and all of this, all of this stuff comes from China. So you want to make sure that you're getting something that you feel comfortable is going to work well and last and, and more importantly that it has what they call the PCB protection. Right? Mm -hmm. So it has chips on there that will allow you to not overcharge and not um, deplete it all the way to zero because that will, you know, cause it to fail a premature life. Right. How about the ma magnetic latching read switches? buy them at the same eBay places? Well, nowadays they're becoming integrated into these these circuits like the Stanton drive and the NCE boards. Um, I think more and more you're gonna see those as far as turning on and off the batteries. And uh, yes, you could get them, the, the boards from Pololu or um, um, SparkFun or one of these others, you know, for battery management boards. What, what currents do these batteries have to provide? I mean, can the connectors and the wires, that seems it's been shrinking. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's not a lot of current involved, right? I mean, you're talking about five, this one, the, my big flat one is 500 milliamp hours, right, at 3.7 volts. So uh, if it's putting out uh, 3.7 volts and being converted up to 12 volts, this may last an hour okay. uh, without charging, but the one I have connected here will charge on the rails. And I'm not completely sold on battery only, so I'm anxious to, to compare once I get my uh, JMRI working and some signaling going, see if there's other options. Would it be uh, advantageous to use super caps instead of batteries? Super caps are still big compared to batteries. I mean, certainly for HO, they're, they're big. Uh, in ON30, maybe that would work, but again, they are only providing maybe 10, 12, 20 seconds of power as opposed to, and maybe we don't need this much power, but maybe, you know, maybe you don't need an hour's worth of power in here, but that's what you can get with a little, you know, cluster like this. So the question is, what is your goal? Are you trying to eliminate wiring um, because you're treating wiring your for, layout, for your layout to, to wiring your, your locomotives? Although again, I think that's all changing. And I think that the, um, the industry is going to see some changes where these are going to become more plug and play, like the Wi-Fi tracks and the Stanton boards, um, okay. where you're just going to, you know, even this um, uh, Blue Rails trains board, I think you can have them installed fairly reasonably. And I gave you a link on my paper to dead rail installs and Pete can, and there's many other people that can do this. And I'm sure Kaylee Zhang would be happy to learn more about it if you paid her. <laughs> The uh, audience wants to know if there's a NMRA standard on this yet. That is missing. So that would be an interesting discussion. Even choosing connectors, something as simple as that would be nice. Uh, NMRA standard for frequency, uh, there isn't anything. But I think the standard is going toward nine point, uh, 916 megahertz. So that um, is becoming common because that's just what's out there. So there is no NMRA standard. and I. You know, we're talking for the NMRA today, and I think that this is a good opportunity for those interested to help support this part of the hobby and and help create that, or at least support some of the guys that are what you know and what they're doing. I think it needs to become more open source, though. Right now, it's a lot of proprietary stuff. Correct. And then the big question, like everywhere else, is Nscale dead? Oh, uh, sorry. Is there a chance for Nscale to go dead? Man, I got this wrong. Is there a Wait chance a for Nscale to get red, dead rail support? Gert, aren't you in Nscale? Shh. Oh, I think I think you're the only guy I know, so I don't know. Um, right now, there's a couple of apps, and I listed them, and I described them on the page. But if you go to um, some of these uh, manufacturers' websites, you'll see that you do not need to put a lot in your locomotives in Nscale. You know, you can have these connected to your, your bus and to your rails in a way that will give you the same kind of connectivity and support that, that we have in larger scales. Okay. And I think it's just a matter of time. But 
Uh, N scale, they're so small, I can't even get this on my tracks. I don't know how do you do that. <laughs> even this little, uh, you know, HO locomotive I have over here, I wanted to show how I could. Uh, I have an old decoder on here. It's so old, I don't even know what it is. It's wrapped in orange tape, um, but it's uh, another consolidation that I've labeled for my own uh, railroad. But you know, I really would like to see um, more. Uh, what's the good word? Consistency or um, way to do this in a way that's uh, plug and play almost. Bonus question: How long do you? How long does it take to charge these batteries? Um, I suppose if you don't want them to in, over inflate, probably a half an hour. You know, for the most part, these these rapid chargers are pretty fast. And I've been using, and I have this one over here too. I've been using uh, this five volt ball wart to charge my batteries using a charge controller. And so now my, you know, my choice of batteries is a 3.7 volt and then just using the 5.7 wall wart. And I think that being able to do that is gonna start with, um, start. we're gonna start seeing some consistency in that kind of choice. And several of the manufacturers are encouraging that direction. So you don't need 12 volts going into any of these decoders. Correct. I keep well, looking yeah. over here because that's where I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the problem we have here as well. When we read the questions, our eyes are, are drifting. And good thing is I'm in a small picture on this big screen. Yeah, thank you very, very much. It's getting kind of late for Gordy, but thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, don't worry about it. Gordy's got more NMRX meetings to go to straight after this. So thank you very much for giving me credit, Neil. That's uh, us completely circumnavigated the, the world. Um, we'll be doing that again, I think, in two weeks' time. Um, so hope everyone can join us. Um, I guess I, all that's left for, for today. Go on, Neil. Oh, I'm sorry. I have videos up on my last name. And there's one in particular called the Porter Kulika. And I'll post some others of my, my current projects running around the layout, which um, I videoed yesterday. I was going to share today, but I think we ran out of time. And we can close with that if you'd like. I'd be happy to share my video. I don't think we can share it through here, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pop it on the end of your video uh, when, we, when we put this onto YouTube. All right, cool. I'll, so, I'll send it to you then. Thanks. Uh, send it to Marty. He'll sort it out. Um, so... That's the end of uh, another great NMRAX event. Um, I just want to say thank you to uh, Speed from the bottom of the Helix, Marty and Brad, um, and all of our families. It, it takes a lot of effort to put one of these on. Uh, we literally don't stop for two weeks in between uh, with sound checks, finding the clinicians, identifying uh, various topics and stuff like that. So I really appreciate the time that these guys give up and, the, and their families uh, give up to the project. And also to all our clinicians who give up their time in preparing their clinics and uh, and everything that goes with that so if you want to